presidential debate was sponsored recently by the nonpartisan committee for political debates. For the next hour and a half, we'll hear from Lenora Falani of the New Alliance Party, John Hagelin of the Natural Law Party, and Howard Phillips of the U.S. Taxpayers Party. We take you now to the George Washington University in the nation's capital for this debate. Good afternoon. My name is Jay Marcus. I'm co-chairman of the Nonpartisan Committee for Political Debates. This committee is sponsoring this debate and has sponsored other presidential debates that include third party or independent candidates. We believe that voter education is best served by election debates that include the third party or independent candidates and present a broad spectrum of political ideas. The inspiration for the formation of our committee in sponsoring these debates is a statement by Chief Justice Earl Warren in a Supreme Court case, Sweezy versus New Hampshire. In that case, Chief Justice Warren stated, all political ideas cannot and should not be channeled into the programs of our two major political parties. <coughs> History has amply proved the virtue of political activity by minority groups, which innumerable times have been in the vanguard of democratic thought and whose programs were ultimately accepted. The absence of such voices would be a symptom of grave illness in our society. <clears throat> our moderator for today's debate is Jeanette Pinckney. She is a broadcast and print journalist with over 15 years experience with CBS News, NBC News, PBS, and is a contributor to the Washington Post. She currently freelances for National Public Radio and Pacific Radio. Ms. Pinckney wrote and narrated a five-part series on the Clarence Thomas Anita Hill hearings, which is currently airing on Pacifica. What you just said, sir, I think is a fraud that this committee is nonpartisan. I do not see up here any representative for the real third party campaign, which everybody is well aware of, of the LaRouche Bevel campaign. Reverend James Bevel, who is a renowned civil rights leader and well known in this community, was willing to come and speak on behalf of the LaRouche Bevel campaign to present his program. Everybody knows that the media has done their best to try and shut out the fact that Lyndon LaRouche is indeed running as president for the United States from his prison cell. I can understand the way the media operates. I cannot understand why a group which calls itself nonpartisan has consciously refused to let Reverend Bevel speak today on behalf of the LaRouche Bevel campaign. I say that outside the door, the LaRouche <laughs> spokesman misses uh, Debbie Freeman is available, and I think before you start any debate, which is to be nonpartisan, that Mrs. Freeman be asked to come in Thank and you to very stand much at the podium. For your comments. Otherwise, it's a fraud. We a appreciate fraud. your perception. Uh, our moderator will set forth the criteria for inclusion in these debates. Uh, I'm sorry you feel that way. We are nonpartisan. Uh, I would please ask that there be no further intrusions. Uh, on this program so that the candidates who have been invited will have the maximum opportunity uh, and I would appreciate your indulgence in that. Controlled debate. Good afternoon. I'd like to first introduce the candidates. They are from your left Howard Phillips, the U.S. Taxpayers Party, Dr. Lenora Falani, the New Alliance Party, and Dr. John Hagelin from the Natural Law Party. And I also want to point out that these three candidates here are representative of the fact that there are third party candidates. 
the criterion that we used to determine who would participate in the debate, in the debate today, uh, there were two criteria. One, that the candidates be on the ballot in at least 15 states, and that it be the actual candidate who is going to appear, not a representative. And we would like to note that there are a number of other third party candidates. These include, in addition to the ones that you just heard mentioned, Jack Herer from the Grassroots Party, Andre Maru from the Libertarian Party of Iowa, Bo Gritz from the American Fir America First Party, James Warren from the Socialist Workers Party, and Ron Daniels from the Campaign for a New Tomorrow. <coughs> the people who will be doing the questioning here today <coughs> are, again from the left of the table, Dr. Lee Siegelman, who is professor and chairman of the Political De Science Department here at George Washington University in Washington, D.C. Dr. Ronald Walters, who is chairman of the Political Science Department at Howard University, also author of Black Presidential Politics and a former deputy campaign manager for the Jackson campaign in 84. And Senator Eugene McCarthy, who is an independent presidential candidate himself in 1976. Senator McCarthy served in the United States House of Representatives from 1948 to 1958 and in the Senate from 1958 to 1970. And this a is couple. I protest. LaRouche is on the ballot in over 20 states, and he is in jail, so he couldn't come. He would have come Sir, if he could. Reverend James registered? Bevel is his representative, and he would have come, and this is a fraud by keeping him out, and it's also Your racism. Your protest has been duly noted, and we are going to proceed with the debate on behalf of the nonpartisan no committee for political proceeding in a debate that's debates. not going to bring up the actual issues of this campaign. Right now, we have being forced onto the citizens of the District of Columbia modern-day lynching by Senator Shelby, where we are being forced to swallow the bitter pill of the death penalty. The LaRouche Bevel campaign Sir, has been the you. only campaign that has stood up against that, called it what it is as lynching. There will be a Sir. rally held by the LaRouche Bevel campaign tomorrow at another issue that has not been addressed by this campaign, Sir, which is the statue of I'm the founder ask, of the Ku please, Klux Klan. I have the microphone you can ask what you will. The fact of the matter is this debate is a fraud and a sham and should not go on as long as the real issues are excluded. But, sir, the this United debate States is, is in an economic on. depression. The LaRouche Bevel campaign has been the only one to lay out the steps necessary to then, rebuild sir, the suggest... crumbling infrastructure of the nation, to stem off the current banking crash, and to correctly point out who was responsible for that. What is the Confederate sir, is policy that is running the United States? I'm going to continue until no, I complete I think you're not what would be said by a LaRouche campaign candidate or representative Reverend Bevel, who was the vice presidential candidate, was a very eloquent speaker, Sir. was the leader with Dr. Martin Luther King Sir. in the 1960s, it, it, was available to be here. Sir, your point and yet you have deliberately made. excluded that. This debate is as rigged as the media coverage of the presidential campaign. It is as rigged as every other debate that has been held. And anybody who participates in this is participating in a total Farce. Sir, Anybody who is serious about changing the direction of this nation should come the, down the, the to the statue of the founder of the, of the Ku Klux group. Klan tomorrow, so which apparently to these people the wish to defend, the statue of the move. founder of the Ku Klux Klan, which stands in Judiciary Square. Sir, it's been there for 91 years. This statue has to, to come down, from the room. I would which shows the kind of McCarthyite tactics that are actually being Sir, used here. It shows the police state measures that members of this campaign, of these campaigns, the are willing to participate in here. Anybody who actually calls this a democratic debate is a liar. Any candidate who is involved should leave now. Hey, how long is it 
put up with this? How are we going to put up with this economic depression we have in the United States right How now? Many How many more people have to be killed by legal lynchings in the United States? Put all Linda LaRouche, James no death Bevel, penalty here. How many people have got to be killed? Supporters, please How many stand up and make killed? your statements Did together. you know that there's a Pi Albert Pike statue in Judiciary Square? We're going to have a rally tomorrow Sir. to bring it down. We're going to have a rally to bring it down tomorrow. We're going to bring it down. <laughs> he started the KKK, sir. He started the KKK. How, sir, come, how come Lyndon LaRouche ain't in here, huh? How come James Bell ain't here? Sir, the how point has been made. Linda Freeman here. No, I'm not going to stop talking. I'm you, not going to well, stop talking. Well, you may not stop talking, but American, you will be I'm leaving the room. Citizen here. I'm an American citizen of the United States of America. You don't do have, have to go home, free? but you do have to leave here. Do I have to be Who's down back? to be free? <laughs> That's what I want to know. We call it is there another? How many people are going to put up with this? Is there the gentleman with the long hair? He's also with the same group? The large gentleman? Oh, will yeah. Once again. <laughs> <laughs> These debates. There is another. Yeah. Hey, there's a pike of the fe the stat there's a statue of the fighter of the KKK in Washington, D.C. It's been there for 90 years, man. What's wrong with you people? Are you insane? You should, you're, you're black. Excuse me, listen to yes, me. Yes, I am insane. black, sir. Would you have any pride? <laughs> I guess this is what's meant by the term political theater. The minute could go on if you would just let Mrs. Freeman speak. She's right there. I mean, she's right in front. She has something to say. She's a spokesman. She was in Richmond last week. I mean, the, the reason that we have to do this should tell you there's a problem. Because you have a candidate who's on the ballot. He's a, he's a legitimate candidate. Sir, Why can't he participate in this debate? Why do we have to do this? The statement, the protest has been duly Why registered. do we have to do this? Ask yourself That's what we're asking. Why do you have to do this? <laughs> Come on, get up now. I know there's another one out there. To refresh your memories, it's a nonpartisan debate. <laughs> Third party presidential candidates, a representative group thereof, sponsored by the Nonpartisan Committee for Political Debates. Good afternoon. She should have called this tripartisan. <laughs> the first question I will uh, take the prerogative of the moderator and ask of each of you, and that is why it is that you are willing, have chosen to subject yourself to the expense and ardors of crisscrossing the country and running for office as third party candidates when it is clear that you do not have a <coughs> chance of winning and especially in an election uh, year where there's a billionaire independent candidate in the race, or at least there was when I, before I came into the room. <laughs> Begin with you, please, Howard Phillips. Is this in lieu of an opening <laughs> statement, or can I'm we sorry, them? you are you are correct. I was, shall we say, slightly nonplussed by That's the right. uh, <laughs> plethora of, of statements that we already had. But yes, you can make your own. <laughs> Thank you very much. Let me uh, begin by saying my name is Howard Phillips. I'm the nominee of the United States Taxpayers Party. We had our first national convention in New Orleans on Labor Day weekend. We brought together a new coalition and nucleus, which included a range of people from Jack Gargan, who started THRO, Throw the Hypocritical Rascals Out, to uh, Bill Dannemeyer, the Republican congressman from California, to uh, uh, David Funderburg, who was Ronald Reagan's ambassador to Romania and blew the whistle on Ceausescu. What unites our party is a belief in the need to substantially reduce federal taxes, spending, and regulation in the context of a return to the basic principles on which our country was founded. We believe that the framers were correct in the Declaration of Independence when they argued that we are endowed by our creator with certain inalienable rights. Our rights are not a gift from the government. They're not a product of man's reason. They are a gift from God. And the duty of the state is to secure those inalienable rights. When the framers gave us the Bill of Rights, they punctuated it with the Tenth Amendment, which said that the federal government shall have only that authority which is explicitly granted to it, with the rest of the power reserved to the states and the people. Let me say that uh, to manifest our genuine commitment to the Bill of Rights and the First Amendment, we believe that no person should be required to subsidize another man's religion, another man's cultural preferences, another man's politics, and I'm the only one of the three candidates on the stage in front of you today 
who has refused to either seek or accept taxpayer funding for his campaign. I would hope that voluntarily you might choose to support me, but I will not require any of you to do so through the Federal Treasury or the tax process. How much more time have I? That's it. Let me, with the last sentence, say I'm the only candidate in this race, including those not at this table, who's ever headed a major domestic agency of the federal government. And be before you begin, I would just like to say that each of your statements will be two minutes. We have a timekeeper in the chair here who will be holding up uh, a card to let you know when you have 30 seconds, but he won't be holding it that high. He'll just be holding it in front of you. <laughs> Uh, first of all, good afternoon. I'm very glad to be here, and I want to thank the um, nonpartisan committee for <clears throat> political debate for inviting me. My name is Dr. Lenora Fulani. In 1988, I made history by becoming the first black and woman to be on the ballot in all 50 states. It was also that year where I qualified the first time for federal primary matching funds. This year, I'm on the ballot in 40 states, and we've raised more than $5.5 million. Two weeks ago, the Joint Center for Political and Economic Studies here in Washington, D.C., named six major states where the black vote could determine the winner of the 92 presidential race. My message to the African American community in those states and in other parts of the country is that we have an extraordinary opportunity to use our vote as a leverage vote. As the margin of victory constituency, everybody wants us. Under these circumstances, it would be ridiculous to give our vote to Bill Clinton and the Democratic Party. In New York City, for example, the black community earlier this year made um, history when they gave 165,000 votes in the Democratic Party to U.S. Senate candidate Reverend Al Sharpton. I'm proud to have not simply supported Reverend Sharpton's run, but to have stood with him for the last seven years on the front lines of every crucial struggle for racial justice in the state and the country. From the Tawana Brawley case, to marching together in Howard Beach in protests of the racist murder of young Michael Griffith, and also over 30 times in um, Bensonhurst in opposition to Yousef Hawkins' death. Our plan, and I'll speak more about this, is to bring the African American community into what is an emerging coalition of independent forces that I believe will build a party large enough and powerful enough by the year 1996 so that we're in a position to take the White House for an independent. And this time around, I want to make sure that the most disenfranchised of our nation are included. Thank you. My name is Dr. John Hagelin, presidential candidate for the Natural Law Party. You've heard a lot from the other candidates in the main debates about problems of spiraling health costs, rising crime, unemployment, national debt, and so forth. What you haven't heard a lot about are solutions. The purpose of the Natural Law Party is to bring to government the most up-to-date, scientifically proven solutions that exist already today, but have been overlooked or ignored by government so far for purely political reasons. As a scientist and concerned citizen, I know there are practical, field-tested, proven solutions to the problems we face as a nation. The purpose of the Natural Law Party is to collect together from across the nation the most up-to-date solutions and best ideas of the Republican Democratic parties of Ross Perot and many other ideas that have never had a voice in politics to bring the most up-to-date and practical solutions to bear immediately in government. The second purpose of this party is to bring government back to the people through over, long overdue campaign finance reform and to restore accountability of government to the people and not to special interest groups. So those are the purposes of the Natural Law Party that I represent today. Just a word about today's <coughs> format. Um, we have already disposed of items one and two, the political protest and the uh, opening statements. <laughs> the candidates will rotate answering questions and the other candidates will then have a period for rebuttal. The initial answer will be two minutes and the rebuttal can be one minute. Uh, the moderator will have the discretion of allowing a questioner to ask a follow-up question of a particular candidate who is responding. In addition to the one-minute uh, limit on the follow-up questions, each candidate will have 
a two-minute period at the end of the debate to summarize his or her position. And we're going to begin the questioning today with Senator Eugene McCarthy. Well, I think I'd start by commending the candidates for what they're doing. Uh, I think it's the only way we can, it may take a long time to get attention to how controlled the political process is. The Supreme Court doesn't respond very, very quickly. I don't know how to judge them out. One of the most pertinent observations of uh, Warren Berger when he became Chief Justice was he wanted to change the shape of the bench uh, physically uh, as well as otherwise. And he gave us one of his reasons. He wanted it to be kind of a V with him at the point. And they settled for a half circle. And uh, uh, Berger said uh, one reason he wanted to change the shape was that the justices were interrupting each other because they couldn't see which one was talking. It's a whole new conception of justice is not blind, it's deaf. <laughs> and I don't think they hear a lot of things that are being said, so you have to keep repeating it. And the, the third party, fourth party, fifth party, multiple party approach, I think, is the only way to get them. And, and it may well be that our problem will have to be settled by the court if they move on to the principle of one person, one vote, and, and freedom of assembly and freedom of speech, that it's almost impossible, at least in I'm talking since 1976, since we began to challenge, uh, to, to break through the kind of control that the two political parties exercise, not only over third parties, but actually f over dissent within the parties. Uh, Dr. Filani and I were running as Democrats in, in uh, New Hampshire, and the control within the party is almost as strong uh, as it is as they move to outside or third party challenges. Uh, we had one rally up there as a kind of protest, and uh, someone said, what's the difference between now and 68? And, we, and Dr. Filani had a rap group, and I said, well, that's what we got now. And in 68, we had Peter, Paul, and Mary saying, puff, <laughs> puff the magic dragon, <laughs> which is a different kind of politics. Uh, in, in any case, uh, I, I, apart from these particular issues, which we'll inquire into, is that the basic question of, uh, of challenging the control over the political system uh, by the two political parties, and not just the parties, but with the powers that are, are, are within the parties. I, uh, well, I'm going to oversimplify, but you have to do that. I was asked the other day about the two major candidates. So, well, Clinton is running to be governor of the United States. <laughs> <laughs> and Bush wants to be commander in chief uh, in about 11 states. <laughs> and it's within that range of choice that you're, you're, you're really now, broad choice you're now being offered. And the, as I see it, the only way to get through to it is just kind of a continuing effort on the part of third, fourth, fifth, and sixth parties, like the Republican Party in, 19, in 1860 when they put together the barn burners and the Greenback Party and the abolitionists and two or three kinds of, uh, of uh, Tories to, to make a new political party. You can't do that now. But we should be able to do it, and your efforts are are, are commendable. I, I don't thank you for doing it. I think we've gotten into the habit of thanking people too much for doing what they should have done anyway. And so I commend you. May we respond to the senator's comments? Or is that? Uh, yes, so if you see a question. Just if there. you do that very briefly. <laughs> <laughs> if you would. I, I do see a question, and the question is what can we do? to limit the ability of the people in power to exclude other people from power. Yeah. I think that's really the question. And uh, I joined with Senator McCarthy uh, in the mid-70s in the Buckley v. Vallejo uh, protest, the lawsuit challenging the federal election law amendments of 1974. <clears throat> Just as in each state there are difficulties in securing ballot access because of onerous laws which vary from state to state, at the federal level our campaigns are regulated by a federal election commission, the members of which are chosen by the leaders of the party in power. The reason none of the three of us were included with Ross Perot, Bill Clinton, and George Bush in part derives from the fact that one of the top Republican lawyers in the country, Frank Ferenkopf, and one of the top Democratic lawyers in the country, Paul Kirk, found it convenient to serve their clients by limiting the number of voices. We need to open the process up. We need to return control over the political process 
to the people it's designed to serve and not let the, the monarchs we're trying to oust limit the terms of engagement. Thank and this you, is Senator a, McCarthy. This is a one-minute answer or response. Okay. I just wanted to say, hi, Senator. It's really good to see you again. Um, it's been um, a real privilege and an inspiration as an independent to watch your work, and uh, I'm glad to be here. I just wanted to make a comment about um, Perot being in the debates, however, relative to opening up the process. While I sued the IRS uh, in order to challenge the tax-exempt status of the Commission on Presidential Debates because they don't have objective criteria, I still realize that the reason why Mr. Perot is on that stage has everything to do with the millions of people in this country who are voting independent for the first time in the history of American politics. As far as I'm concerned, Perot is on that stage because of the work that we have done for many, many years. I claim it as a victory. I take great pride in it. And I think there will be a nev never another debate in this country. Republicans, we put Perot on that stage. That's a success for the independent political movement. You're right. I have nothing to rebut. I agree with everything that's been said already, and I assume we'll get more into the question of democratic reform as the debate unfolds. Before we move to Dr. Walters, I would like to go back to my uh, opening question of why you are willing as third-party candidates to subject yourselves to this process or have it inflicted upon you, depending upon how you see it, both in terms of uh, the physical energy and the financial resources that it requires. Who should be I'm grateful for the opportunity uh, to be seeking the presidency this year. Uh, I'm doing it because I believe that there is a need for a change in this country. I believe both political parties are part of the problem. The American people have manifested their unhappiness with the Democratic control of the Congress, the Republican <coughs> control of the White House. As a conservative, I'm profoundly disturbed that there has been a missed opportunity for those who share my views. Since 1968, the Republican Party has been capturing the presidency by campaigning as the anti-liberal party, but it's been governing as a status quo party, which has consolidated and expanded the problems and the programs which it inherited. I believe we're coming to a period of dramatic political change, not just because people are unhappy with what they have now, but because we are on the verge of falling into a hyperinflationary depression. My concern is that instead of blaming the politicians and blaming ourselves, the people may blame the system. We need to try the system. We've ignored the Constitution for too long. Later in this decade, I believe that people will consider a return to the constitutional principles and premises which permitted America grow, to grow to become a great nation. And it will be my purpose to uh, participate in that fruition. I'm. Um running as an independent for President of the United States for the second time because I think the real problem is the American people submitting ourselves to the tortures of a two-party system which have completely converted our democracy and our economy into a mess. I think I agree with the 84 percent of the um, American people who in a survey earlier this summer pointed out that there was a desperate need for fundamental restructuring of the political system in this nation. And I've played a key role along with members of the New Alliance Party and others to fight to open up the political process and do what we consider a deregulation of democracy that would allow for a wide, broad um, passage of legislation that allows the American people and ordinary people to participate in how America works. I think it's much more difficult to sit back and watch what the Democrats and Republicans have done to this nation over the last 200 years. Why am I engaging in this campaign? Well, I think it would take a miracle to win this election. The Natural Law Party is only five months old, but it is the fastest growing political party in the country. I also think it would take a miracle for us not to win the election in 1996. But the purpose of contesting this election is because into the mainstream of politics, new ideas and new solutions that work. And if we can educate the American people that there are simple, proven solutions to the problems we face as a nation, they will insist that their own candidates, whether that is Bush or Clinton or Perot or anyone else, adopt these solutions or risk losing their support. We've been very happy to find over the past months of this election that the other candidates, particularly Bill Clinton, have been quick 
to adopt many of the programs and solutions from the Natural Law Party platform. We have given our platform to all three of these gentlemen and said, use it. Take from out of it whatever you possibly can use, because the purpose of the Natural Law Party is not to become career politicians, but to bring solutions to the problems we face as a nation. And if some other party is in a position to do that for us, that also will be a fulfillment for the purpose of founding this newest political party. Walters, because I know that you wanted to ask some about campaign financing. Yes. Uh, I anticipate there's going to be a lot of disagreement this afternoon, but perhaps we can start off on, on what I think will be an, an area of agreement among the candidates. I anticipate. Perhaps it won't be. And that is by asking you to comment on federal campaign finance laws and their impact on third-party candidates. I'd like to begin this time with Dr. Falani, please. Well, I think that campaign reform is critical if we're going to have a process that is fair and open. I uh, obviously support the, the um, public financing of campaigns. I think that if we had more of that and we fought to eliminate the political action committees, that we would be way ahead of ourselves. The role that political action committees play in this country is that it's sometimes uh, legal and sometimes an illegal way to funnel money from major corporations into the pocketbooks and pockets of politicians who, although we put them in office, they no longer are there to represent us. So we've been um, fighting to help form and pass legislation that would eliminate the political action committees that would open up uh, campaign financing to the public, basically. I think it's critical also to set limits on how much money can be spent during a campaign. I think it's actually the corporations who are thrilled with the fact that it costs so much money to run for president or for Senate or for the Congress, because as long as it costs that level of money, the top 1% or the top 10% of this nation will control politics and ordinary people will continue to be screwed. Dr. Hagelin. I would agree strongly that campaign finance reform is critical to our democratic process. We need to eliminate the loophole known as soft money or soft contributions. We need to eliminate or severely limit contributions from PACs or special interest groups. If you're a senator running for re-election, as one of our panelists knows, I'm sure, you have to raise a great deal of money. And that can occupy a fair amount of your time in Washington, which can be spent fundraising and not governing. But the main problem is that much of that money comes from Washington, not from back home, from the voters who voted us initially into Washington, but from special interest groups. And the lobbies in Washington who ha exert such power over the direction of legislation in our country have their clout on the basis of those financial contributions. The SNL crisis is a perfect example of a government that is more accountable to special interest groups than to the people. That deregulation of the SNL industry was put through committee basically by a powerful SNL lobby. And that resulting crisis will cost every taxpayer in this country $3,600, a $500 billion disaster. The public financing of campaigns would cost taxpayers $5 to $10 per year. But compare that expense to the $3,600 we will each pay to bail out the SNL industry, and you'll see the importance of having a government accountable to the people and not to special interest groups. Uh, my view is that we need to stop, rather than expand, government regulation at the federal level and government subsidy at all levels of the political process. The problem we have is that people in office are seeking to buy our votes with our own money. As long as the federal treasury can be used as a slush fund for special interest groups, it really won't matter much what kind of regulations are imposed on the political process. I would eliminate all of those regulations and let everybody have the same rights that Ross Perot has, and let everyone have the same rights that are now reserved to the Republican and Democratic parties. Senator McCarthy was correct when he pointed out that one of the reasons there is so little independence in Congress is that the incumbent president, the leader of the party, is able to determine whether a candidate for the Senate gets an extra $2 million in campaign contributions, is able to determine whether a candidate for the House gets another few hundred thousand dollars. Look at the case of Dwayne Andreas of Archer Daniels Midland. Here's a man who lives off of special privileges from federal regulations and federal subsidies. He has his own ambassador in Moscow, Bob Strauss, 
who used to be on his board of directors, used to be his lawyer, used to be a major stockholder in his company. He's George Bush's major donor, and George Bush pushes more than $5.1 billion in taxpayer guaranteed and subsidized grain sales to the Soviets, of which Mr. Andreas is a principal beneficiary. The answer is not to restrict our liberties, it's to deny George Bush and the Democrats the power to use the federal treasury to subsidize their friends. Dr. Walters will ask the next question. Well, I would also like to thank the uh, nonpartisan committee for hosting these debates because one of the things we've seen on the part of the major media is the fact that the selection of the candidates to be on the debates, to give all the attention to, has resulted in the non-democratic process. And one of the consequences of that undemocratic process is that many of the issues that people feel very strongly about are eliminated from the debate. For example, this election takes place against the backdrop of the rebellions in Los Angeles and in many other cities. And yet, uh, we haven't heard that issue really addressed by the people who are running for office. When the most urgent task of this campaign or any other is how to bind up the internal wounds of this nation. And so, Dr. Filani, I would like to ask you, uh, since you talked about the question of uh, process and forming coalitions, how does that process relate to the urban areas of this country? And would you give us, in particular, your public policy agenda that would have the effect of redeveloping the urban areas in this country? Mm -hmm. Well, I guess there are a couple of things. One is in terms of um, the relationship to the urban areas and, and communities of color. I think that the only way that our agenda, the agenda of the African American and Latino communities and working people will be included in the development and growth of a third party is if we fight like mad to be there. One of the reasons why I am encouraging the black community, for example, to not vote for Bill Clinton, who I think has a very um, bad agenda um, relative to urban issues. I don't think his agenda is that different from that of George Bush's, and I think it's been expressed mm -hmm. in Mr. Clinton's total disrespect for the African-American community over this campaign year. Uh, one of the reasons why I think the African-American community should not vote Democrat this year and go independent in a big way is so that we can use the leverage that we get from <coughs> voting independent to put pressure on the Democrats who we put in office year in and year out to force them to deal very um, concretely with issues in, of concern in our community. So for example, in New York City, um, in Harlem, the area that Charles Rangel, who's the congressperson, is in charge of, has one of the highest infant mortality rates, not just in the country, but in the world. And Mr. Rangel has taken over $350,000 in PAC money from um, medical industry PACs, which literally compromises him when he sits on the House Ways and Means Committee um, in his capacity to represent the families of those dying babies. What I intend to do in New York City in getting a significant vote out of Central Harlem where he reigns is to go visit him the day after election and say to him, just like we use these votes as in an independent presidential campaign, we can use these same votes to remove you from office as Congress, if in fact, you, as a congressperson, if in fact you're not responsive. I think that's extremely critical. I think that leverage vote uh, demonstrated by African Americans and other people in this country gives us political clout so that we can shape yes. an urban agenda yes, but in what whatever is the, ways we choose. Yes, but what is the agenda? I mean, you spent uh, all of the time allotted uh, talking in generalities about uh, politics in Harlem, uh, when the question I asked was, what were the specifics of your urban agenda uh, well, the that would agenda, have the effect of redeveloping the urban area? The agenda is having opportunity for jobs. The agenda is what people are talking about all over the country relative to education. But what I'm raising with you and what I think is extremely critical in a centerpiece of the independent political movement is that if we don't have political leverage so that we can force politicians who we put in office to be responsive to us, we could have the best agenda in the, in the world, but we have no way to force them to sit down at the table and go with us. I guarantee you, if I get a significant black vote 
in this country, we will force these politicians to the table. Here in Washington, D.C., neither the Democrats nor the Republicans are de dealing seriously with statehood, which is one of the agendas that people in this area and the black community are demanding. The Republicans won't do it because they don't want to give that kind of control to the Democrats. The Democrats won't do it because the black voter in Washington is too independent. They gave Jesse 80% of the vote in 1988. They gave me somewhere between 5 and 7%. If the black voter in this state gives, I mean, in the District of Columbia, gives me a significant portion of their vote in 1992 on November 3rd, I guarantee you the Democrats will come to the table. But why not talk about the agenda in specific terms? You still haven't talked about any policy agenda at all. Well, can I answer the question? Sure. I want to? Okay. <laughs> I, I really want to urge this issue of um, political leverage. I think that that's, that's what we need in order to carry out whatever our agenda is. <clears throat> Dr. Walters, did you want that same question addressed to all the candidates? Or was that no, specific? I can ask a different question. If you're well, I would like to respond to that in any case. Right. Dr. Hagley. The Natural Law Party was founded to heal the national psyche and to create unity and coherence in the collective consciousness of our country. The democratic process, as it has been practiced so far, has been unable to satisfy everyone. Aspects of the society, minority, is often compromised for the interests of the majority. As long as those types of programs that are not sufficiently comprehensive are functioning, aspects of our society will remain unfulfilled. That gives rise to growing frustration, tension, rising stress levels that will inevitably erupt as crime, violence, drug abuse, and other problems, particularly in our inner cities. Natural Law Party supports programs that have been used in 160 of our inner cities and shown to reduce stress levels dramatically. We support prevention-oriented health education clinics and programs which will provide high-quality health care to every American citizen at a net cost savings to the nation. We support educational programs that will prevent dropouts by holding a student's interest, by developing their full creativity and intelligence. A quarter of our inner city students drop out of high school each year. They become the principal targets of inner city crime of drug abuse and other problems. So we need a comprehensive range of universally enriching programs to revitalize our inner cities and the nation as a whole. The Natural Law Party was founded to collect all these programs together and bring them to bear immediately. But if you Dr. believe in natural <coughs> law, don't you believe in the natural order of things? And if we concretize the natural order of things, wouldn't you concretize subordination with blacks and minorities and others, Native Americans? Hispanics? My understanding of natural law as a scientist studying nature is the simultaneous coexistence of millions of different species and millions of different organisms, each one of those organisms growing, evolving, and contributing to each other's well-being. I see natural law as a universally enriching principle of nature, but mainly as a scientist I see natural law as the laws of physics, laws of chemistry, laws upholding human health, laws governing our environment, laws of economics. The purpose of this party is to bring the most up-to-date scientific knowledge of natural law and new technologies and programs based on that knowledge to bear in government, programs that have been shown to cut crime, pr promote better health and cut health costs, etc. We're talking about good programs for our country. May I be permitted to comment on this you question? You may, but I'd like first to follow up, sure. please, with Dr. Hagelin. I think everyone in this room and the viewing audience would be interested in hearing some of the specific techniques that you've used for reducing stress levels. Can we hear a little more on that? The most effective technique that has been used so far and studied scientifically for cutting stress is probably transcendental meditation. The most stressful environment I know of is maximum security prisons. The TM technique has been used there in California, Vermont, Massachusetts, shown to cut stress, restore balance in the physiology and psychology, and ultimately prevent the rate of return to prison. On the basis of the research on the TM program in the prisons, done at Harvard University, other countries have adopted this program nationally. And as a result, they've experienced a 90% drop in the rate of return to prison. If we use this simple program here in this country, just in the prisons, we could save $80 billion per year in crime costs and prevent untold crime-related pain and suffering. Similar programs have been used in the inner cities to cut stress, social stress, reduce crime, accidents, hospital admissions, violence, and to increase the positive trends throughout society. And am I to understand, and I don't want to speak for you, but am I to understand that your feeling or the, the position of your party is that if the stress levels are reduced, if we have less crime, that will then take care of the other economic ills that 
exist in society? No, economy. Uh, society? No, the solution to the economy is not that simple. But if we can cut crime, we can take eighty billion dollars out of our federal budget. Um, the other solutions to economy. This is perhaps a second question. Is number one, I believe the most powerful fiscal action a government can take to stimulate the economy, to provide a basis for economic growth and prosperity, is to cut taxes significantly and responsibly. Cutting taxes responsibly means without adding to the budget deficit and without cutting essential services. The only way you can do that, obviously, is through some new knowledge, some new programs. Preventive medicine, which can save our country $400 billion per year. Effective crime prevention, energy conservation, etc. We can trim $700 billion off of our federal budget through easily identifiable savings on the basis of the most up-to-date knowledge. If you can do that, you can balance the budget, you can cut taxes significantly, you can promote better services and propel the economy into a growth phase, putting an end to unemployment and a declining standard of living now and for the future. And Mr. Phillips, your response to Dr. Walter's question about the urban agenda. Let me say that uh, I'm just as interested in reducing stress as is Dr. Hageland. But I think uh, the stress with which we ought to concern ourselves is the stress faced by American taxpayers and American citizens. I think the problem facing our country, moreover, is not so much st stress when it comes to crime as it is sin and evil intent. And uh, to deal with crime, to permit the people of Washington, D.C. and other cities throughout this country and states and localities throughout the country uh, deal with the problems of crime would certainly increase their stress levels. I would get the federal government out of the business of interfering with judicial process. I believe the people who live in a particular community where a crime is committed should have the right to apprehend the suspect on testimony of two witnesses to bring the suspect to trial. If the suspect is convicted of a violent crime against uh, a person, placing that person's life or safety at risk. I believe the people in the community where the crime occurred should have the ability, <coughs> without external interference, to administer justice. And in appropriate cases, that justice would include the death penalty. And I believe that uh, we need to go from a situation where today we have a death penalty for the innocent people who walk the streets of our cities, but no death penalty for the criminals. Uh, with respect to the economic aspect of my urban agenda, my economic program for our cities would be the same as my economic program for the entire country. It is to significantly reduce uh, the spending, the taxing, and the regulating of the federal government. It's increasingly difficult for small businesses to move forward. They're forced to make co-payment on Social Security taxes. They have to hire additional lawyers and accountants to deal with new federal regulations. They're burdened with corporate taxes. They're burdened with the fact that heavy government borrowing is crowding out investment capital. And as a result, it's harder and harder to get the jobs, especially if you're young, entering the workforce, or if you're older in life and have been laid off. And so these companies are moving to temporary employees, independent contractors, and uh, <clears throat> automation. As a first step in my first year as president, should I be so fortunate as to win the confidence of the American people, I would propose rolling back federal spending from the $1.5 trillion which we have today to the $1 trillion which the government spent five years ago. A 50% increase please, Mr. Phillips. in five years is unacceptable. To be time, continued. Mr. Phillips. Next question, please, from Senator McCarthy. Well, I was going to say you, you should be encouraged, Mr. Phillips, in that, <laughs> that your program and that of George Bush are essentially the same. It's uh, it's a great leap forward from James Otis, who said that taxation without representation was tyranny, which sort of spurred the revolution. We now have representation without taxation. Well, George Bush has raised the taxes and raised the spending. I would cut it. Well, he hasn't accomplished his ultimate purpose, which would, would be the perfect life where you could represent and not tax. And uh, <coughs> your program would come to that a little bit. I'm not really want to push this too hard. Uh, the uh, issue of anxiety, I think, is a critical one, and, and the divisiveness uh, in the political process now and the exclusion. Hannah Arendt said that the most dangerous thing in her book on the origins of totalitarianism was when you begin to surplus people. Say, so these are people we don't need. 
uh, either they're too old or they're racial, we don't need them for the economy. And I thought one of the, I, I don't know, one of the most significant, you keep looking for significant statements, they're hard to find. But General Motors, uh, back when Charlie Wilson became Secretary of Defense under Eisenhower, uh, he said, uh, what's good for General Motors is good for the country, and vice versa. When General Motors announced uh, the dismissal of 70,000 people was it last year, they said, uh, whoever spoke for them said, this is good for General Motors, and it's good for the country, but it's also good for the 70,000, the people who are not laid off. So the employees who were kept were to rejoice because they were laid off and their jobs were made se more secure because 70,000 people were laid off. In effect, say, we don't need as many workers as we had. And I think there's a disposition to say, let's just kind of uh, warehouse people until we need them for war. When war comes, everybody is, is employable blacks and whites and old and young. But in between, we say, well, we'll just put you off here and, uh, and hold you until we need you. And if, if uh, you die in between, why, that doesn't hurt anybody. And this is the general disposition, really, of, of the country today. And the general motors, these corporate people are interesting. Um, they, they, have, uh, they have strange minds that they're sort of amoral. You can't accuse them of immorality because it, it's, it's amoral. And, that's almost worse. An uh, immoral person sort of knows what moral is. And uh, Robert Lowell said, the worst sound in the universe is the harsh, high laughter of the amoral rejoicing over their victories. So you have a whole society which begins to be determined by amoral judgments. And the corporate, uh, uh, Woodrow Wilson said, you should never call a corporation a legal person. Don't call it a person because it'll begin to act as though it were one and it's going to be something inadequate. And I think the issues you're, you're raising here, uh, and, and the corporations begin to, and, and they're persons without full conscience or, so, or social sensitivity. And the multinationals are worse. They don't, uh, they don't like national loyalty. Uh, a nation involves loyalty to persons and loyalty to land. Uh, a multinational corporation, uh, especially the financial ones, have no loyalty to person or, to, or to, to reality. And so they try to reduce every factor of production to the same level as, as money. And it's in that range that we're operating with a multinational, amoral and without any significant conscience, without any loyalty, uh, that is beginning to form not just uh, kind of the world attitudes, but it's, it's intruding really on the United States. And you have to stand against it, and, and it's hard to do it. Uh, I mean, blame everything on the two parties, but they seem entirely insensitive to it because their interest is pretty much in... Both major parties are supporting a trade agreement That's which right. for corporate profit would send hundreds of thousands of jobs out of the country. That's right. And when Clinton says, you know, this is a right-to-work state, the nation is being made right-to-work, and, uh, and it's international right-to-work in which you compete uh, with the lowest-paid workers any place in the world, and also it moves to where you won't protect natural resources, saying you, we, we can exploit ours because we have to compete with people who are exploiting resources in Brazil or in Russia or wherever it may be. Thank you, Senator McCarthy. I'd like to take just a moment to reintroduce both the panelists and the candidates. The candidates from left to right are Howard Phillips from the U.S. Taxpayers Party, Dr. Lenora Falani with the New Alliance Party, Dr. John Hagelin with the Natural Law Party. All, of course, third party candidates for president. Can, can and I our questioners from left to right are Dr. Lee Siegelman, who is the chairman of the Political Science Department here at George Washington University. Dr. Ronald Walters, chairman of the Political Science Department at Howard University. And Senator Eugene McCarthy, independent candidate for president, president in 1976. We are going to... Uh, Proceed now with questions, please, from Dr. Siegelman. One of the primary purposes of a third party candidacy is, as I think all of the candidates have said, to inject new ideas or, in some cases, to re inject old ideas into the campaign. I would like uh, to address this specifically to Mr. Phillips, but I'd also like to hear the other two candidates uh, comment. 
on uh, the tax policy, the federal tax policy that their particular party advocates. Let me uh, just preface that by saying that while I agree with Senator McCarthy in opposing NAFTA, the Mexico Free Trade Agreement, I do believe that uh, opposition to compulsory unionism is not a bad idea, that people should have a right to work without uh, joining a union if they wish to do so. Now, with respect to our tax policy, uh, we believe that the entire present tax system of the United States should be scrapped. The Internal Revenue Code is a joy to lawyers, and it's a, a disaster for everyone else in this country, unless they belong to a big eight accounting firm. Uh, the federal income tax last year, the individual income tax, produced $468 billion in revenues for the federal government which was about 35% of what the federal government spent. What we would do is change the system so that there were two primary sources of revenue for the federal government. One would, <coughs> excuse me, one source of revenue would be the tariff. The tariff is a legitimate revenue raising device. Abraham Lincoln, the first Republican president, said that if you have to choose between raising tariffs on foreign companies and products and taxes on American workers and businesses, he would prefer tariffs, and I agree. Second, to the extent that tariffs do not do the job, I would move to a state rate tax, where instead of having the federal government directly tax the American people, we would create the buffer of the states. Let's say we had to raise $500 billion in revenues, and New York had 10% of the population. They would be responsible for raising 10% of $500,000, $50 billion. I checked Dan Quayle on that, and I think that adds up. And uh, the $50 billion could be raised by the people of New York, by their governor, by their legislature, in any manner that they chose. If they wanted to do it by a sales tax or an income tax, that would be their judgment. In such a manner, by having the people of each state recognize what their share of the overall burden happened to be, the pressures exerted by the states on the federal government would be for less federal spending rather than more and that would relieve the burden on all people who pay taxes. Dr. Filati? Yeah. I think the, the um, American people are not complaining about paying taxes in abstraction. I think the issues that they're raising, that we're raising, is that we pay taxes and we see no return. <laughs> we pay taxes if we're working class, if we're uh, middle income, that literally take, um, that cover for the loopholes that wealthy people in this country are allowed to have. So I would support any tax system that we came up with as a people in this country that we decided to go with. And one thing in particular, um, I don't think that we can find out from the American people what kind of taxation they do want or don't want, who they think should be taxed. I think we should tax people who have more money um, more and those of us who have less, less. But I think the only way that we can even approach that is if we open up the political process so that people can make their wishes known. One of the um, things that we've been fighting for, for example, is same day and automatic voter registration as a way to open up the process. When you have automatic voter registration and same day registration, you hear more from the American people. I think there should be um, legislation passed that would be, rather than having an election day in this country, we would have an election week. People do that already in European countries so that folks can get to the polls who are elderly, who are parents, who are students, who are disabled, and have the opportunity to express what their will and desire is. Thank I you, Dr. Filani. Dr. Um, Hagelin, please. We would also support simplification of the tax laws. We have also advocated about a 40% across the board tax cut. We would not replace these taxes with tariffs. Tariffs beget further tariffs. That sort of protectionism prevents the exportation of American goods as well as the importation of foreign goods. We tried this sort of protect protectionism at the time of the Great Depression. People now think that that protectionism probably extended our depression by as much as seven years. What we would do is we would tax less and spend less, but without cutting essential services. Again, you can only do this through more effective programs. Prevention-oriented natural medicines, prevention-oriented health education, energy conservation technologies that exist today that could cut our use of fossil fuels in half, eliminate dependence on foreign oil, save $46 billion per year in fuel costs. These and other programs of effective crime prevention, prison rehabilitation, etc., can save our federal government $700 billion per year, enough to eliminate the $400 billion deficit, cut taxes by some 40% and promote better services, better health, 
lower crime for the nation. The next question will come, please, from Dr. Walters. Yes, well, I noticed um, there was a very strong sentiment uh, on the panel for tax cuts. And uh, I'm wondering if um, you've thought very carefully about the implications of the tax cut. Because if we would go back to a period before World War II and take the advice of most of uh, the panelists, we would have no space program, no cure for many of the diseases that are haunting us, uh, and many things that we have come to accept as a proper role of government. So my question is in the question of the role of government. I'm wondering, uh, on the revenue side, uh, if we're talking about cutting taxes to the bone, we're talking about less revenue. And if we have less revenue, then uh, what would you do, for example, in the present global competitive atmosphere, when all the other successful nations in the world have a very aggressive policy of having the government prime the pump in terms of economic development strategy and do what at least one of the candidates suggests, and that is invest in very critical sectors of the economy. So I'm wondering if you thought, Mr. Phillips, I'll give you this question and the others can answer, about the implications of this so-called uh, tax reduction policy, which right now is causing uh, the California educational system to go down the drain, uh, causing poverty in the states like Michigan, where 83,000 people were thrown off the rolls and only 13 percent have found jobs. I wonder if we thought very carefully about this uh, uh, net revenue loss strategy. Dr. Walters, government does not produce wealth, it consumes it. One of the reasons J uh, Japan and Germany have been outstripping us is that we've been paying for their defense and they haven't had to pay for their own. I believe we should pay for our defense. I disagree yeah, with uh, both Bill Clinton and George Bush about the 25 to 30 percent reductions in defense that they would uh, institute. I think we live in a very dangerous world. Russian missiles are still aimed our way. We still have no defense against them. <clears throat> there is considerable turmoil uh, within the former Soviet Union. The KGB still exists, albeit under a different name. The Red Army is still there. We heard two days ago they're unwilling to leave Latvia, Lithuania, and Estonia. Uh, I would move forward immediately by deploying SDI. I, I believe that the space program is a legitimate function of the federal government, but I don't think the federal government has been improved, or our country has been improved, by the vast expansion in the federal role that we've seen over the last 30 years. When Jack Kennedy became president in 1961, federal spending was less than $100 billion a year. About half of it went for defense. Today, federal spending is $1.5 trillion a year. I believe the country was better off economically 30 years ago than it is today. And one of the reasons it was better off is the taxes were lower, there was less regulation, there was less government intervention in the credit markets, there was less government manipulation for the worse of our society. It was a time when every year the family could look forward to a better standard of living than it enjoyed the previous year. Now, each year, it's harder and harder to make ends meet, and it takes more and more people from the family to sustain the standard of living to which the family has become accustomed. So I think the answer is less government. That's why in our first year, we would use our veto to slash federal spending and transfer $500 billion of resources from the government sector to the private sector. We can spend our own money better than bureaucrats can. They have no right to spend our money for us. Let us make those decisions. But how would you do that if you're going to maintain the military establishment? You just said. You just said that you're going to maintain the military yes, establishment. Don't you consider that to be federal spending? Absolutely. And I would roll back federal spending across the board from $1.5 trillion in the current budget to the $1 trillion which obtained in fiscal year 87. By that standard, You could do military, that without cutting defense? <coughs> Uh, if you took the 1987 numbers and substituted them for the current year numbers, they'd be better for the Defense Department. But the total military budget is only a trillion dollars, 347 billion a year. The, the total military going? budget is well under 300 billion dollars, and it's going down dramatically. Under the new proposals, it would go down to about 247 billion. That's about one fifth of overall federal spending. And uh, it, let's say you cap it at 300 billion. 200 billion dollars a year should be plenty to cover all of the other legitimate functions of the federal government. Can I respond? See, I think that um, how issues get defined in this country uh, make a big difference. I don't think that the American people 
or the issue of taxation is to raise them or lower them or get rid of the government. I think the reality is that nobody ever bothers to ask the people in this country how we want to spend the money that we do control, that we do produce. The money that the government is using and the distribution of it, it's money that comes from taxpayers. The only time we're ever asked about how we want to spend one dollar is doing campaign financing when you check the back of an IRS form and agree you know, to give a dollar to um, whoever, you know, to candidates who are running for office. I think that what we have to do is that we need to take over determining what the budget is in this country. I think the federal government should be forced to present us with a pie graph of how they're currently spending our money, because I think they spend it on things that allow for, again, people who have in this country to gain more, and that basically abandons the majority of people in this nation. And then I think accompanying that should be boxes where we get to choose where we want that money to go. One of the most brilliant ideas that came out of the 92 presidential race is the idea that Perot presented around electronic town hall meetings. Well, we would get in a room as people across the country, we could use technology to do this and duke it out and determine how we want our economy to function. Somebody makes those decisions. And in fact, in the 1940s, the decisions were made by the Democrats and Republicans to turn over our tax dollars, almost the entire economy, to speculation and investments in a military industrial complex. So when I talk about democracy, I'm not talking about you know, the democracy that we learn about in seventh grade civics. I'm talking about the people in this room and the people in this country being in a position to say, this is my money, this is how I want it spent, this is what we submit as a budget, mandatory budget to the Congress, and this is what you have to do with it, as opposed to what currently goes on, which they spend our money, and they leave us with a deficit that is tremendously huge, and we have no say in it. That's why democracy is critical, and opening up the process is even more critical. Dr. Faglin on tax cuts. Well, I firstly support very strongly what Dr. Fulani just said about the electronic town hall and making government more accountable to the people. On tax cuts, if you examine our platform, you will find that we have advocated <clears throat> over five years $700 billion worth of cuts at the federal government level. Not one of those cuts is at the expense of services with the possible exception of military, if you call that a service. The types of savings we're talking about are savings through more effective health care based on the most up-to-date knowledge of prevention, uh, effective prison rehabilitation, energy conservation technologies that exist today, and so forth. When it comes to defense, I would disagree with Mr. Phillips because I don't think a $300 billion defense budget will protect us against incoming nuclear missiles any more than a $200 billion defense budget. And we have advocated $94 billion worth of defense cuts over the next five years. Seven billion of that can be cut from military health costs through prevention. Seven billion can be cut from wasteful military procurement practices. Four billion of that, I, four billion I can say with certainty as a particle physicist, can be cut from the SDI research, research program with no effect whatsoever on our national security. We can have a more mobile, a smaller, national defense without compromising the alertness or preparedness of American armed forces, and I think that is in keeping with a changing world order. We are a superpower without an enemy. I think we can no longer afford to overlook that fact. The next question will be from Senator Eugene McCarthy. Well, I have two questions of policy. Um, I, I, I always hate to quote myself, but I do it more and more. Uh, <laughs> <laughs> Sometimes I take credit, sometimes I say, as a former senator, senator said, and uh, I've even gotten to, starting to plagiarize myself, this is the ultimate tribute. But I tried to raise two issues in this campaign, which were completely ignored uh, uh, by the media. And I'm going to say that, uh, that this kind of democratic approach to politics does not meet the approval, as you know, of Tom Brokaw. <laughs> Tom said it was all right for Perot to do this directly with the people, but at some point that he and the anchor men had to intervene so as to clear up everybody's ideas. And I thought the greatest indignity in the last campaign was when the five or six Democratic candidates sat down on chairs and let Tom Brokaw walk around saying, answer my questions. You know, Tom is sort of like the kid you'd help draw lines between the dots on the placemats and <coughs> Howard Johnson, just to be sure you got it right. The two questions, one we raised it, uh, was a redistribution of work. 
shortening the working time, redistributing the work we have. It relates to tension. People are overworked in this country. <coughs> There's a very good, almost a movement, I think, a woman named Shore wrote a book about how we are overworked and how it relates to single parent families and two parents working in the whole thrust. We haven't done anything to shorten work since 1938 when we uh, established the 40 hour a week and the eight hour a day and the 50 week year. And you've had 40, almost 50 years of progress in automation and all these new techniques. And we still say, and the labor movement ran ads in, in this last campaign, not only promising people a 40 hour a week and a five day week, but overtime, overtime when if we distributed the overtime being worked now, it would, it would probably employ just about a million people who are out of work. And here's the labor movement promising not just a full day's work at a week, but at a year, but overtime to its members. Uh, and we have eight, 10 million people out of work and, and people overworked and you know, two, uh, two hours a day, people work just to support their automobile as uh, Dr. Hegler has indicated. Uh, this is an old device developed by Henry Ford back in 1914. Uh, Henry introduced the five, five dollar a day payment and the eight hour a day. And he said you had to pay people enough so they could buy what they were producing. And you had to give them enough time in the morning to drive to work and drive back home at night. Otherwise they wouldn't buy the car. By 1926, Henry was smart. He said, you got to give them a two-day weekend so they have more time to drive the car <laughs> and more incentive to buy the car. And, and he was right. And we, we live under, under those conditions today. Well, in any case, the question of, of a, a shorter working week or lifetime or year or month, I think, is a critical issue with us. And the second I'd ask about is tax policy. Uh, I suggested that in New Hampshire uh, that what we really had to do to, to deal with, and all the things that are being proposed now, Perot and Clinton and uh, Bush, have nothing to do with the uh, $4 trillion debt. They're just saying we're going to cut the deficit in five years, which means the $4 trillion debt, if, 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 the, if they actually do balance the budget annually, will continue as a burden costing us 200 to 250 billion dollars a year. And every taxpaying earning person has a $40,000 debt as their share of the federal debt right now. And I proposed a, a, a tax, a, a levy on accumulated wealth in this country. 10% uh, of the people have 70% of the wealth. In the last 12 years, the increase, according to Brookings, 1% got 77%. So it's getting worse, the concentration. And so we don't really have to wait for them to die, you know. Uh, we could just tell them we need it now. <laughs> and, and, and if, in fact, they, they actually own and control about $12 trillion, this 10%, if, if you took four from them and applied it to the debt, they'd still have eight which would be 50% of the wealth of the country controlled by 10% of the people. And you know, he gets supporting things for this. I said, Paul Mellon wrote a book recently. He said he didn't know how much money he had. And I think if you started to tax Paul until he got to where he could count his money, <laughs> it would be a useful service. You say, well, now you know what you're worth, because otherwise you're kind of floating in outer space. And we got down to where you say, how far can you count, Paul? Can you, you, know, can you count to a, a billion? Well, you recognize what a billion is? He said, well, I don't know that I can. We'd say, oh, we'll cut it down <laughs> to get down to where it's within the range of, of your mathematical ability. <laughs> or Paul Getty thought he was worth three billion. Pennzoil said, yes, you are. And Texaco said, no, you're worth six, Paul, or George, whichever one is left. And the Texas judge said, no, you're worth 12 billion. Well, if we had taxed nine billion away from Getty when he thought he was only worth three, He'd been no worse off than he thought he was. And the public would have had $9 billion to apply on the debt. So on the question of the national debt then? Is, is how do you approach the debt? What about a capital levy? Mm -hmm. and, and the other is a redistribution of work. All right. And we're going to go Dr. Hagelin and then Mr. Phillips and Dr. Filani. 
Well, I must say on this issue I disagree with the senator. I am myself a university professor and somebody without financial means, but I don't resent the rich person. We can balance our budget, we can eliminate our debt, and we can do so through simple means. We can save $400 billion as a nation on health through simple preventive measures. Prevention-oriented health education, prevention-oriented natural medicines, which have been shown in extensive scientific research to promote better health and to cut health costs by 50 to 70 percent. That is an amount by itself which exceeds our annual budget deficit. So I'm not for new taxes, even new taxes on the rich. I'm for lower taxes across the board. I don't think we need new taxes. I think that could have a recessionary influence on our economy. It's better to leave, to have the government with more efficient programs, leave more tax dollars in the taxpayers' pockets. The taxpayers will spend that money, invest that money. And research shows that when you do that, when you let the private sector spend, it has more than twice the effect on creating jobs and also twice the multiplier effect on the economy. So we don't need new taxes, we need new knowledge. We need better programs and the knowledge exists today. My beef with the other political parties is that, is that they have not done their homework. There exist programs today that have been field tested and extensively shown to work that would allow us to balance our budget, cut taxes, promote better services. Government should have at its disposal the most up-to-date knowledge and most effective programs where it does not deserve to be the government of the United States of America. Oh. I think the um, current distribution of wealth in this country is what is the key problem in, that stands in the way of economic growth and development. And I think that that has to be addressed and by redistribution of wealth I don't mean um, the government coming into our houses and taking our last $500 or the VCR. I think that what redistribution of wealth has to deal with is the fact that the resources of this country and of our economy are located and amassed at the very, very top. And it doesn't work that that money um, circulates through the economy and ends up in the pockets of ordinary people. There was a, um, a study that came out a few months ago that showed that there was a booming uh, period during the 1980s of Ronald Reagan's era and that over 60% of the resources that came out in this country went to the gains, went to 1%, the top 1% in the nation. So it's, just not, it's not just a matter of a lack of knowledge, it's the fact that the people who make the political and economic decisions in this country make decisions that favor people at the top. And we have to address that, those of us who are most impacted upon by these decisions, by getting a foothold in the country's economy, economic decision making, domestic policy, um, and also foreign policy, so that we can generate ideas and demands on our government so that money is spent to advance the quality of life of ordinary and normal people. <coughs> I think if we had a national health care system, for example, and it was set up so that the people at the top with the most money had to pay more for health care as opposed to a family of four, um, which makes $15,000 a year, that would have an impact on wealth redistribution. If we took the profit out of drugs, right now the drug companies get to choose how they're going to price drugs. That's one of the reasons why 260,000 people will have died by the end of this year from AIDS. So again, I think that a lot of the economic decisions that are made are made by people who they benefit, and those of us who are not benefited by them have to be in a position to grab political clout so we can give direction to how we want money spent and how we want the economy to function. Think of what would happen if we reduced the wealth of the Astors and the Vanderbilts and the Drews and the Harrimans. Those are the most acquisitive genes in the American gene pool. And they've been resting for five generations in right, some when cases. They are and if we turn them <laughs> loose, the Japanese wouldn't know what hit them. I mean, they say something's happened in America. There's a new strength there. It could just be a <clears throat> old John Jacob Astor into the fifth generation turning loose, you know. It's also the case that who Excuse makes me. the decisions about how the economy works you know. impacts upon how the economy works. And if it's the Rockefellers and the Astors and the Clintons and the Bushes, Excuse they will me, always Dr. make decisions Blimey. in their behalf rather than behalf I think you're right. the question is to be answered now by <laughs> Mr. Phillips. Come on, Phillips. Finally. Well, Senator, this is a good debate. You, <laughs> you uh, Start off by getting to quote yourself, and then you get to answer your own question. Oh, I'm sure. Take a, take a <laughs> crack at well, it, I do it. Uh, there is another word for redistribution of other people's wealth, and it's called theft. 
And, uh, right, the savings and loans thugs and demonstrated I that. And I, got it. <laughs> and I don't believe in theft, whether it's accomplished at the point of a gun uh, on a dark street or whether it's accomplished in elegant surroundings by majority vote. Uh, the government has certain limited defined functions to uh, secure our God-given rights to life, liberty, and property. It does not perform those functions very well. Unfortunately, it does steal very well. One example of redistribution is the fact that taxpayers have had some millions of dollars redistributed from them to the Fulani campaign in 1988 and 1992. That's an example of redistribution in which I disagree. I'm, I'm sure that uh, uh, my colleague here is very grateful for having all of that extra spending money, but I frankly regard it as uh, an illicit form of redistribution. With respect to the, uh, and I'm the only candidate here, and neither Clinton uh, nor Bush, the other non-billionaires in the race, uh, uh, can distinguish themselves from uh, Dr. Hagelin or Ms. Filani on this. I'm the only candidate here who has declined to either seek or accept federal funding requiring taxpayers to support my candidacy in any way other than voluntarily. I did the same Livers thing. I didn't take any money. I know you did. I wouldn't. And I, and I respect yeah. you for that, Senator. Uh, with respect to the debt, <clears throat> it's a growing problem. Under Ronald Reagan, the debt tripled from $914 billion to $2.8 trillion. Now it's grown to $4.1 trillion. If present trends continue, that debt will be $6 or $7 trillion by 1996. Interest on the debt has been relatively low because of relatively low interest rates. Every additional percent of interest increases debt service costs by $40 billion. We're not very far from the day when it's going to cost us a half a trillion, three quarters of a trillion dollars a year to service the debt. There are only a few ways to deal with it. You can cut spending, which is the right way. You can raise taxes. They're at the point of saturation. You can sell off assets. We should do some of that. Or Thank you can you. borrow money, increasingly difficult, or inflate the money supply. They Time are now Mr. In, Phillips. We're going to have a now final question and we're from going to feel it in a few Dr. Years. Von Walters. One of the subjects that we haven't uh, touched on is the question of foreign <coughs> policy and international affairs. And so I would like to, um, to point to the fact that uh, George Bush had a concept called the New World Order, and neither he nor anyone else knew what it meant. Um, and I think that there's a coming consensus around the fact that American economic security uh, has a role to play in our national security. I would like to know how you would uh, apply these concepts to two things. First, the rearrangement of the political face of Europe, and secondly, uh, many of the problems in the, the third world, particularly problems like uh, Somalia. And this two-minute answer will come first from Dr. Filani, then Dr. Hagelin, and finally Mr. Phillips. I want to uh, address this to Dr. Hagelin. Okay. All right. Firstly, we would effect an immediate shift in U.S. foreign aid from one that is based principally on military aid to one that is based on the exportation of U.S. knowledge, U.S. know-how in such areas as business administration, agriculture, environmental and energy technologies, to allow more countries to get on their own feet financially, to become financially self-sufficient. We agree that U.S. security interests have shifted from principally military ones to economic ones, energy ones, environmental ones. We all share the same environment. We must cooperate together environmentally and ecologically and economically. So I would recommend a shift in U.S. foreign policy to exportation of U.S. know-how backed where necessary with economic aid to allow more countries to become more self-sufficient. This more life-supporting and nourishing type of foreign policy would create a more affluent and prosperous family of nations. And the United States would be the first beneficiary of a more affluent and prosperous fam family of nations. Beneficiary in terms of reduced military expenditures, beneficiary in terms of better trading partners, the whole world would share in this increasing prosperity. Dr. Filani. Yeah, I, I think that we know what George Bush's New World Order is all about, and I think that the best way that we see that ex expressed is in U.S. foreign policy towards third world countries. I think the outrage of the treatment of the Haitian people who sought asylum here um, <coughs> earlier this year and still continue to seek asylum because of the madness of a coup that eliminated their democracy by getting rid of President Aristide 
and having neither the Democrats nor the Republicans take a strong stance in order to restore um, Aristide to Haiti. All they have to do is pick up the telephone and speak to their friends because we played a critical role in creating the environment that produced that coup in the first place. I think that the abandonment of the Haitian people to murder on the sea or murder in their country is an expression of that new world order. And I think it's, it underscores overall America's foreign policy, which is based on greed and a double standard when it comes to people of color. I also just found out um, there, there has been a major upheaval in Zaire, um, where Mobutu, who is a fascist, he's one of the wealthiest men in the world, and the uh, Zairean people are some of the poorest. And the reason why Mobutu is still in office in uh, Zaire is because of the support of the State Department of this country and our unwillingness to move in ways to support the democracy fight uh, amongst the people of Zaire. We just got these terrible stories um, that in the midst of a choice of a new prime minister that came out of the democracy movement here, uh, uh, Techian Chesakadi, who we brought in to meet with the Congress a few <laughs> He's giving me 30 seconds. Anyway, I think that, I guess the underlying issue again is that our foreign policy posture is very, very negative towards community, I mean, countries of color. If we want to change that, I think that the foreign policy that is implemented has to come about as a result of what the American people want. I think we need to be much more learned about foreign policy because under the guise of foreign aid, a lot of investments are made by multinational uh, corporations, and a lot of ill will is spread around the nation, which is part of why people in why people in other parts of the world are so opposed to the American government, and you know feel that we've basically invaded their privacy and destroyed their democracy. Mr. But I need Phillips, our foreign please. policy has to be dictated by Mr. Phillips, more please. choice on our part. Thank you, <clears throat> Dr. Walters. George Bush gave us a definition of the New World Order when he spoke to the New York Economics Club in February of 1991. He said he wanted to transfer more power to international organizations. I believe the defense of the autonomy of the American nation is essential to the preservation of our liberty. I oppose the increasing transfer of our resources and our decision-making authority to international bureaucracies beyond accountability to the American people or their elected representatives. I object to the manipulation and control of American foreign policy by international banks and multinational corporations which uh, have been able to use the federal treasury as a laundering operation. During the 1970s and the early 80s, a number of banks made very unwise loans to socialist regimes around the world. Now, this year, George Bush is taking $12 billion sending it to the International Monetary Fund, they're sending it in turn to some of those regimes which were the beneficiaries of the loans, and that taxpayer money is being used to pay back the banks. Those banks had the profits, they should suffer the penalties. The American people did not share in those profits, we should not be required to bear the burden. In Croatia and Serbia, we have a crisis today, partly because George Bush put in charge of our policy for Yugoslavia, Lawrence Eagleburger and Brent Scowcroft both of whom, as employees of Henry Kissinger's lobbying firms and representational firm, had been on the payroll of the Yugoslav communist government in Belgrade, representing the Ljubljana National Bank, representing Global Motors, Yugo, etc. And they told the people of Yugoslavia, who were being raped by the Belgrade government, that they would have to negotiate with the rapist before we would stop subsidizing the Belgrade government, before we would stop helping them get international financial support before we would stop training Belgrade communist soldiers in the United States of America. We denied recognition to the people of Bosnia, Croatia, and Slovenia. And even today, as part of this very co corrupt relationship, we deny the people of Bosnia the right to purchase weapons of self-defense on the free market. It's similar to the pattern in the Baltic states, where because of Bush's desire to cozy up to Gorbachev and the business interests which had private deals with the Moscow regime that we were the 37th country to recognize the legitimate aspirations for independence of those people. Time and is up, Mr. Phillips. Thank could you. Could I reassure much. Dr. Walters on one question about George's <coughs> language? You know, Yale has got a school of semantics called deconstructionists, and they say they can take anybody's language and deconstruct it. But what they don't tell you is that George talks deconstructed. 
So with him, you do it the other way around if you can. <laughs> and if you reverse their process, as it said, Henry Adams' wife said about Henry, his problem is he chews more than he bites off. <laughs> and on that note, we will have the closing statements by the candidates in alphabetical order, beginning, please, with Dr. Lenora Filani. First of all, is, uh, representing the New Alliance Party. Yes, I would like to thank the nonpartisan <coughs> committee for hosting this debate. And I also just wanted to um, underscore the fact that there is an electoral revolution going on in America today. That revolution is made up of a host of political forces, significant forces, who are building, I believe, what will be the ground rule or the ground swell for a major independent political party by the year 2000. Those forces include United We Stand America, the Perot Base, the Libertarians, the Natural Law Party, the 21st Century Party, and the Independence Party, which was founded by Governor Lowell Weicker um, in September of this year, along with John Anderson. My particular role, and the role of the New Alliance Party, which I chair, is to guarantee that this time around, those people in this country, our country, who have been most disenfranchised, the African American community, the Latino community, the gay and lesbian community, women and the poor, will have a front row seat in determining the direction of this, of this party so that we guarantee that there are options, that there are decent and pro-humane solutions to poverty and racism and the many things that have befallen us. I also just want to pay tribute to the people who are on the front lines around building this independent political movement because those are the heroes and the heroines, in my opinion, of politics. <coughs> in fact, George Bush or Bill Clinton will be in the White House on November 3rd, but on November 4th, we're going to roll up our sleeves and go to work to guarantee that we have an independent in 1996 or the year 2000 so that the kinds of concerns that we have as a people, all kinds of people will be addressed. We can only do that by building an independent political movement. In case you've been wondering, that noise we've been hearing from time to time is it's actually a <laughs> creative energy that is emanating from the art department on the floor above us here at George Washington University. I thought it was Dick Darman. <laughs> <laughs> Closing statement, please, from Dr. John Hagelin with the Natural Law Party. Only a new seed will yield a new crop. The same old knowledge, the same old programs and political slogans <coughs> that have failed to solve the nation's problems for decades will not magically begin to work today in 1992. It takes new knowledge, new programs, new attitudes, and new expertise in Washington to turn the country around. The Natural Law Party stands for the most up-to-date, proven, and humane solutions to the problems we face as a nation. We stand for a truly national government. If elected, we would invite the best ideas and talents of all political parties to form a truly national government, an all-party cabinet, which will bring the best ideas and solutions in a nonpartisan way to bear for the American people. Finally, the most important thing that we're going to achieve today, through all of our efforts between now and November 3rd and afterwards, is probably to inject these new ideas and new solutions into the mainstream of political political life so that our elected representative, whoever that may be, starting next year, will be compelled to act on these programs and this new knowledge that can turn our country around. I invite your support in this effort. <coughs> I'd also invite you to watch <coughs> this Friday evening on October 23rd at 8.30 Eastern Standard Time on NBC, a television program giving more details about the Natural Law Party platform and our candidacy. That will also be 8.30 on the West Coast. And good luck to you for a more democratic and successful America. And the closing statement from Mr. Howard Phillips, U.S. Taxpayers Party. I would be remiss if I failed to intrude perhaps the most important domestic issue we face, the issue of the right to life of innocent unborn children. Since the Roe versus Wade decision in 1973, tens of millions of unborn children have been deprived of their life with the support of the government of the United States. As President of the United States, I would terminate the $400 million a year which George Bush sends from our tax dollars 
to Planned Parenthood and other pro-abortion groups. I would name to the federal bench only judges committed to affirm the personhood of the unborn child, and I would name as U.S. attorneys prosecutors prepared to prosecute for premeditated murder, abortionists who for a profit destroy innocent unborn life of all races, colors, ethnicities, both genders, and all backgrounds. Let me say with respect to other issues that it's important that we not waste our vote. We waste our vote when we cast it for candidates with whom we disagree, who are advancing policies in which we do not believe. This country currently is headed over the cliff. It doesn't much matter whether we get there at 80 miles an hour with George Bush or 90 miles an hour with Bill Clinton. We need to do more than change drivers. We need to change trains and change directions. We offer a new direction. We're offering the American people a grand bargain. Help us cut spending by $500 billion, and we will eliminate the income tax, which <coughs> yielded less than $500 billion last year, and pump into the economy new consumption, new savings, new investment, and new jobs. And once we've done that, we'll move toward a balanced budget by eliminating all of the programs that we did not have before the Great Society arrived in town. We don't need a larger federal government. We need a stronger private sector so that you and I can spend the money we earn instead of having it redistributed by politicians. Thank you very much. Again, a note that these three candidates were chosen on the basis of being on the ballot in at least 15 states and that the actual nominee and not a representative would participate these three represent or are representative of an entire field of candidates. I want to say a quick thank you very much to Senator Eugene McCarthy. <laughs> to Dr. Ronald Walters, Chairman of the Political Science Department at Howard University. And a thank you to Dr. Lee Siegelman, Chairman of the Political Science Department here at George Washington University. Thank you. Also, a thank you to George Washington University for the helpfulness of its staff and the use of its facility. This debate was brought to you by the Nonpartisan Committee for Political Debates, which is based in Fairfield, Iowa, and is chaired by Jay Marcus and Richard Winger. I'm Junette Pinkley with one final word, vote. <laughs> You can send questions and comments on this debate to the Nonpartisan Committee for Political Debates. The address is 107 South Main Street, Fairfield, Iowa, 52256. Coming next, an update of our program schedule.